Good morning to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church. And on behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, all of the officers and members of this church, we thank you for joining us for our Sunday School lesson. Today is December 4th, and we have an amazing and wonderful lesson entitled A Special Promise, taken from Luke chapter 1, verses 8 through 20. Today we talked about the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist. We know that he was the one sent before Jesus Christ to prepare the way for Jesus Christ, uh, specifically called a voice crying in the wilderness. And so we're excited that as we enter this Christmas celebration, as we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ throughout the month of December, that we can really start to focus on the miraculous ways that God not only announced the birth of Jesus, but prepared the way for Jesus. Uh, in this case, by sending his cousin John the Baptist as a forerunner, if you will, an ambassador for Christ, one that would go out and prepare the way. And if we look at ourselves today as Christians, and we really want to break down what our responsibility, our roles, our function is in the world, we too serve the same function that John the Baptist served some 2,000 years ago. We are forerunners, ambassadors for Christ. We're sent to go out into the world of darkness, shining the light of God, the light of love that he has placed inside each and every one of us. And our sole purpose, our job, is to draw others out of darkness and into the marvelous light through our love, through our works that are based on our faith. And so as we enter into this lesson, it's important that we recognize that John the Baptist was not a lone ranger, that he was not an army of one, but he was the first of many, the first of thousands, the first of millions. And we are those as well. We are those that are called to be lights shining in the midst of darkness, to be the salt of the, uh, the earth, the, the light of the world. And so our key verse today comes from Luke chapter 1, verse 13, and all of our scripture will come from the New King James Version. The key verse reads, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. So we have three purposes today. First, we will examine the announcement of John's birth. Second, we will examine what Zacharias felt while dealing with the birth of John. And third, we will commit uh, to trusting uh, and believing in God's word when he answers our prayers and having the patience and faith to wait on God to answer those prayers. So we'll begin with prayer and jump right into our lesson. If you stumbled upon us for the first uh, time, we don't believe it's an accident. We believe that it's Holy Spirit ordained. And so we ask that you would uh, make sure that you subscribe to our channel and turn on your notifications so that you can get all of our content, our Wednesday evening Bible class and our Sunday morning worship. And for those of you all that have been uh, joining us throughout these lessons that we've started right at the onset of this COVID pandemic, as always, we thank you for your support and your presence, but most importantly, for your prayers. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and another opportunity to study your word. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you continue to shine upon us, even those that we don't deserve. Father, we thank you for your love and your faith that you have given to us, that we have the opportunity and the privilege to show to others. Now, as we break into your bread of life, we ask that you empty us out, that we might receive your word and your wisdom and be better equipped to face the challenges of today. Lord, lift us up higher that we might see you clearer and better understand the will for your lives, for our lives. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Excuse me, just rushing a little bit this morning. Uh, so we'll... Uh, the background... And we'll cover that type of vision. So the first part of our lesson is entitled, As We Serve, God Will Bless. Luke chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Again, I'll be reading New King James Version. The text reads, So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot failed to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. So Zacharias was a uh, priest during the time of Herod. This is about 400 years since the people have heard from God, known as the intertestamental period. And during this time, the Greeks and the Romans had took over much of the known land, and the, the language changed from Hebrew to Greek, the monetary system changed, the travel routes changed, and all these cities were occupied with representatives, if you, if you will, of the Greek and Roman Empire. 
And so the world had changed tremendously over the last three or 400 years, specifically for the children of Israel. And even though the world had changed and they had changed the way that they uh, worshiped, excuse me, the way that they spoke, the way that they lived, they still held on to their Jewish roots. And that included their system of worship. So when they would go about worshiping each morning, a priest would light an incense and all the children of Israel would gather outside and they would begin to pray and to worship and to petition God while this ceremony would take place. So if we look at Zechariah specifically, he was married to a woman named Elizabeth who was a descendant of Aaron. If you remember, uh, Aaron was the mother of Moses, uh, who during the time of the Exodus from Egypt was appointed as the prophet of Moses because Moses was uncomfortable with the way he spoke, a uh, stuttering uh, issue that he had a speech impediment. And so Aaron and his family of the tribe of Levi, Aaron's, his descendants were granted or blessed with the opportunity to be the specific priest uh, throughout Israel over the years. And so even though the number was small, it was Aaron and then his sons. Initially, over time, uh, this number grew to the thousands, and uh, modern historians, theologians, believe that there might have been as many as 10 to 15,000 people that considered themselves priests from the tribe of Levi during the time of our lesson. So even though the temple priests were from a specific tribe, the tribe of Levi, their numbers just multitude, and there were many, many people. And so for Zacharias to be chosen uh, to deliver, uh, to burn the incense, was not only a great privilege, but it was uh, something that was rare, and oftentimes people would go their entire lives without receiving this blessing. So they would draw lots, excuse me, draw lots to determine who would serve in the temple, and which person, which one of the priests would be responsible for each issue. So each morning, the priest who drew the lot in order to light the the, the incense would make his way to the temple and he would hit like a gong light instrument and it would let the people know what was happening. As he entered the temple to uh, burn the incense, the other priests or the people from the tribe of Levi that were outside the temple, they would begin to lead the people in worship and song and prayer. So it would kind of be like an impromptu worship service that broke out each morning. This would normally happen right around sunrise each morning. So the priest would hit this instrument, they would all begin to worship, and then uh, Zacharias would go in and he would light the incense. And the daily worship, this will often encompass all the Jews of the community or the children of Israel of the community, uh, unless they had other commitments, specifically work, working in the field, security type roles, things like that. And so even though the drawing of Lot seems to be arbitrary and by chance, we have to understand the role in which God and the Holy Spirit supersedes or oversees, superintends this process. That even though it seems that it, you're just drawing it sticks, God decides who gets which stick, who gets which lot, and God specifically selected Zacharias. And then because of Zacharias was selected, and because the Holy Spirit chose him, we get a, a glimpse, if you will, of the character and the faith of Zacharias, and we can understand that he had strong character strong faith that he lived a righteous life because he was chosen by God to do this great uh, uh, worship uh, task. Now, when a priest would be chosen to light the incense, he would be allowed to enter into the temple. Many priests, as I said, the numbers had grown into the thousands as modern theologians uh, count now. Many priests never even entered the temple, never got a chance to go in, never got a chance to perform these sacred rituals, these sacred uh, uh, roles. And so this was a great honor and a highlight in the life of Zacharias. As a matter of fact, it probably was the single most important thing that ever happened to him, at least from his role or his position as a priest, that he was selected to go in and light the incense in the temple. Now, not all men would qualify by birth. You had to be of the tribe of Levi. And then very few men that qualified by birth would qualify by their lifestyle. If we look, if we look in uh, Leviticus, we remember that it was uh, Nadab and it was another one. Uh, two priests went into the Holy of Holies and they were unworthy and they dropped dead, had to be pulled out by the strings that were tied around their waist. They would literally tie strings around people's waists so that if they dropped dead, entering unworthy, they would be able to pull them out without having to go in themselves and risk life. And so it's kind of uh, mindful of, uh, uh, for those of us that are called to the gospel that when we preach, uh, those of us that have any type of responsibility or role uh, in worship, uh, a, a deacon, an usher, a nurse, if you're praying, if you're leading, reading scripture, if you're leading in song, uh, even Sunday school instructors, every time before we get before God's people, 
every time before we begin to study and prepare our lessons, and specifically when we're speaking, there's like an a, a, a uneasiness, a, a, a fear, if you will. And I know God does not give us a, sp a spirit of fear, but I, I have to be honest, I, I get nervous every time I go into the pulpit, every time I hit the record button on Restream before we record our Sunday school lessons. I get nervous. I start to doubt uh, my, my what's the right word I'm looking for? I, uh, my own ability to do the work that God has called me to do. I start to worry if I've prepared and studied enough. I start to question my lifestyle and the things that I know I should not do that I have done. And all these things just kind of rush through my mind as I prepare to stand before God's people. And then I just kind of realize that it's not because I'm worthy or that, it's, that I'm qualified, it's that I've been called by God to do what he has called me to do. And then I can look past my shortcomings, past my flaws. Now, constantly praying that God grows me from those things and that God uh, delivers me from those things that I need to be delivered from, but also trusting that I'll never be perfect. And so my job is to do the best that I can to live a life that's pleasing in the sight of God and try to be available and useful to God whenever he calls and needs me to be called. And so if we look specifically at Zacharias, we see that he is there to faithfully carry out his work. And through his faithfulness to God, he's put in a position to be blessed. Now, if we can fast forward through the next few verses of this lesson, we know that the, uh, the uh, messenger of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, has sent Gabriel to deliver to Zacharias that him and his wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son named John. And so we know that the blessing is on its way, but it's Zacharias' faithfulness that positions him in place for a blessing. I can't tell you how many times that I've been blessed simply by being faithful to what God has called me to be. There have been several times here at church where I've got here early enough, and since the Bacchus might have made an extra breakfast sandwich. I know it may not seem like a lot, but that's a blessing that I've got an extra sandwich just simply because I was here earlier than I should have been. I can't tell you how many times that uh, there's been extra or overflow or surplus. And just because I was there on site or just because I was in the building, that God has opened up a window and blessed me with things that I didn't even know was coming, things that I didn't expect. Uh, and so as Christians, we can all testify, whether it be big or small, uh, whether it be a great value of things that are insignificant in the eyes of the world, that just because we've been faithful, God has placed us in position to receive blessings that we had no idea that we needed or wanted or were even available to be uh, uh, available for us. And so we, we celebrate the faithfulness of Zacharias. His faithfulness positions him to be called as the priest that would light the incense. His faithfulness positions him to have the greatest joy of his life by entering into this temple. And then his faithfulness positions him to be blessed by the Lord while he was performing the duties of the Lord. So many of us miss out on our blessings because we oversleep, because we aren't prepared when our name is called. Uh, I, I, I used to be more relaxed in my attire for church and worship, uh, kind of like wearing jogging suits and things like that. And especially when COVID hit, I kind of got even more relaxed thinking that there wasn't a real necessity to have a three-piece suit on every worship service. But then I started to recognize that there were opportunities to serve and to be used and to be called, even in times of need where I was needed, but because I wasn't properly dressed or had the right clothes on, I might have been a disturbance for some. Now, I know we shouldn't worry about what other people wear and what other people have on, but sometimes people get hung up on those things. And as Christians, our responsibility is not to force people into a place where they're not ready to go. And so if people are still caught up on clothes or ties or suits out of respect for where they are right now, I can't just force down their throat what I think I should be comfortable in worship wearing. And so if I'm at a church that's traditional and conservative in our attire, then maybe I should be more conservative and traditional in my attire as I seek to be a worship leader in that place of worship. And so it's, it's like a give and take, and I know these are things that we struggle with, but if I am here to serve as a minister of the gospel and to be used by God when he needs me, then I must be dressed for the part. I must look the part. I must be ready. I can't be hung over from the night before. I can't be late because I was 
uh, running late or having made some stops on the way to worship, I must decide that if I'm going to do the work that God has called me to do, that I must be ready and able to be used by him when he needs me and not when it's comfortable for me. And so Zacharias, going back to the main character of our lesson, his faithfulness made him able and willing to be used by God, and then his faithfulness put him in a position to be blessed. So first we see, as we serve, God will bless. But now we jump down to verses 11 through 14, and we see God's promise prolonged, but not precluded. Luke chapter 1, verses 11 through 14 reads, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. So while Zacharias is performing his duties, the angel of the Lord appears next to the altar. Now, an already exciting and pressure-filled moment is only heightened by the miraculous arrival of Gabriel, God's messenger angel. So Zacharias' response was to become fearful and troubled. And what I must confess is new and different is uncomfortable for even the most faithful of us. When things change, when things are not what we're used to, when things are out of the norm, we become uneasy and almost agitated, unsure of how to move forward. Now, for a people of faith that claim to believe in the miraculous power of our Lord and Savior, we serve a God that raised the dead, that gives sight to the blind, that lets food fall down from heaven and water flow from rocks. But whenever God performs those same miracles in our lives, we become fearful and afraid because we're not sure how to comprehend or how to accept the miraculous power of Jesus Christ. Now, I know that God does not operate the same way that he has in the Old Testament and throughout Scripture. And Jesus specifically told us that the purpose of these signs and miracles were so that we would believe. And now because we have the benefit of the written word, we don't necessarily need to depend wholly on miraculous signs. But that does not mean that miracles don't exist in 2022. As a matter of fact, we can testify that as a people, we are recipients of God's miraculous power. And many of us are standing on miracles right now. Some of us have been addicted to things that God has delivered us from, and it's only a miracle that we're still alive. Some of us have committed crimes or done things that we should have been locked away, and they should have thrown away the key, but yet we're still free, and that's evidence of God's miracle-working power in our lives. Even now, thousands die weekly from this COVID pandemic that we've been dealing with for almost three years now, but many of us are still here, survivors of COVID, when so many have lost their lives. That's evidence of God's miracle-working power. I can't tell you how many times I've been in places I should not have been in where bullets flying over my head and I walked out unscathed, even though others were shot, some lost their lives. Again, evidence of God's miracle working power. And if you've never been through any of those things I just named, just the fact that God woke us up this morning, that he continues to keep us in our right mind, that he continues to bless us even beyond what we earned or what we deserve is evidence of God's miracle working power. And so Zacharias has been praying his entire life for this son. And then the angel of the Lord appears to him while he's serving the Lord in the temple. If any place you would expect God to show up is at the temple in church and Zacharias becomes fearful. But as always, in the midst of our fear, God has a way of calming our fears. The angel of the Lord says, be not afraid, I am the angel of the Lord. And so God has a way of in our deepest, darkest moments of speaking to us and pulling us out and capturing us for himself. And so the angel of the Lord does his best to calm the fears of Zacharias, and he lets him know that my presence is directly in response to your petition. And so we go again to the prayers of Zacharias. Uh, throughout our, through the text and by evidence of what Gabriel says to him, we see that Zacharias has at least in the past prayed that God will give him a child. Now, it's important that when we ask of God, and expect something of God, we can't become uncomfortable and fearful when God shows up. Uh, I've come to learn in my life uh, that God doesn't always work the way that I want him to work. I know that doesn't make much sense, but uh, even in my prayer life, I become more free in my asking of God to operate. I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, I tell this story often. I once uh, signed up for Columbia House DVD or CD service where you pay 99 cents and got 10 
and you had to buy six over the course of 12 months, I quickly realized that the cost of the DVDs and the expense was more than I realized. And I got myself into some financial trouble owing Columbia House almost two, $300. Now, I didn't have the money. I was like an 18-year-old, 19-year-old college student. $300 might as well have been $3 million at the time. I didn't know how I was going to pay it. And every month they would send me a letter and then the interest would continue to rise. And then soon two or 300 became 400. I just became so, so uncomfortable. And I quickly started worrying about credit and debt and all those things. And I just thought that my financial life was over because I owed this money to Columbia House. And I kept asking, literally, I remember praying to God, Lord, give me $400 so I could just pay this bill and be done with it. Lord, give me $400. And I never got $400 or at least $400 for that purpose. And I just remember just being so uncomfortable. They would call my phone. I would try to hit in and not answer. And one day I just answered. And I was like, you know what, ma'am? I understand the issue. I don't want to be like a deadbeat, but I just don't have the money. I'm a college student. Is there any way you could give me an extension or give me a payment plan? And she said, well, we've been trying to reach you for quite some time. We're glad you answered. Uh, right now we're running a promotion where if you pay $100 or buy four DVDs, we'll wipe out all your debt. So I was able to get the $100, I think, from my parents. I paid off the $100, and I wiped out the debt. The thing that was amazing to me was my prayers were not that God fixes the situation. My prayers were not that God turns this uncomfortable uh, situation around. My prayers was that God gives me $400. And my prayers went unanswered because I decided how God was going to fix my situation. Meanwhile, if I would have just answered the call, not only would I have avoided months and months of stress and uneasiness, but I would have been out of that situation much earlier. God has a way of blessing us beyond what we can even understand. When we ask for healing, God might wipe the entire disease away. When we ask for an extension, God might wipe the entire debt away. And so we have to be comfortable praying to God, say, I don't know how you will do it. I don't even know if you will do it, but I know that you can. And so God, any way you bless me, I'll be satisfied. And that's how we need to pray. And so Zacharias, a man that is of faith, a man that is righteous, a man that's obviously qualified to serve and to lead the people in worship, he becomes uncomfortable when God sends his messenger to the place of worship to deliver him good news. And so my only warning today to those of us of faith would be to us, for us to understand that we should never be uneasy or uncomfortable when God blesses us. Our job is to say, God, like the songwriter said, any way you bless me, I'll be satisfied. And so that should be our prayer. We, again, we can't ask and expect of God but become uncomfortable and fearful when he shows up. And there's, uh, this, this appearance is directly in response to Zachariah's previous prayers, but it seems to be that it's not response to Zacharias's current prayers. Now, in verse 18, kind of fast forwarding a little bit, uh, when Zacharias responds to the angel of the Lord, to Gabriel, he says, how can this be? I'm too old to have a child. This means that most certainly a long time ago, before he got of age, and then please don't, uh, don't stick me with this, but we can only go with uh, historical uh, studies. Theologians believe that Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth were between the ages of 50 and 70 years old because of the way the text identifies their age as being too old to have children and very into their older years, elder years. Uh, they, they anticipate that they were, or they, they, they kind of arrive at the conclusion between 50 and 70 years old. So this 50 to 70 year old man who has a barren wife and now is too old to bear children himself most certainly stopped at least five, 10 years ago praying to God for a child. That means that he has probably forgotten that that was his prayers and has moved on. Now we see that because God did not bless them with a child, it did not affect his faith at this point in time. But if you allow my sanctified imagination, as the old preacher would say, to kind of wander a little bit, it's difficult when we pray to God for something, especially for something that matters that much to us, like a child or an heir, and God does not answer our prayers in our time because the world convinces us that God has turned his back on us, that God is ignoring us, or that we're not worthy for what we're asking for. And so even though Zacharias is strong in faith at the time of our lesson, I am sure, or I'm almost sure, I can't say I'm sure, I'm almost sure that him and his wife probably struggled throughout the years as they wondered why they didn't have a child. 
as they looked at other people giving birth and questioned their own health and questioned their own ability. As a matter of fact, in a lesson that we studied about four months ago, we saw that a woman not able to bear a child in the current culture that, we, that the, our lesson is taken in was considered unfit to be a wife. That oftentimes the husband would marry a second wife in order to have an heir. And so all these things are happening culturally and because of the way that the, the social climate is of the day, yet Zacharias and Elizabeth remain strong in their faith. Uh, so when God does not answer our prayers or respond to our prayers in our own time, and it's important that we do three things. One, that we don't give up on God. God never gives up on us, and he's never short of his word. And we've seen throughout the written record and throughout our own experience that God can do it seemingly and abundantly above all that we can ask. And so when God does not answer our prayers when we think that he should, first, we should never give, give up on God. Second, we should never doubt the power of our prayers. Our prayers have the ability to reach God. And just because he doesn't respond in our own timing does not mean that they fall on deaf ears, does not mean that they're going to the wrong direction. It just means that God's timing is different than our timing. So we don't give on God. We don't doubt the power of our prayers. But third, we don't put an expiration date on the power of God. In a world in which we live in, where things go bad and things run its course and things expire, we can understand that God's timing is different. Again, children of Israel leaving Egypt, a 40-day journey took 40 years. God's timing is different. Uh, Elizabeth and, and Zachariah is here. Not until they get into their elder years, past the childbearing years, does God bless them with a child. God's timing is different. And then if we look at blacks in America, these last three or four years have been filled with uh, social uprising as we continue to challenge the status quo on blacks not being treated equally throughout this country in a number of areas. Now, after 400 years of oppression, after the f uh, freedom of the slaves, after the civil rights movement, after the voting laws, after the women's suffrage movement, you would think that we would be a lot further along than where we are right now. But just because we aren't at the place that we think we should be or the place that God might have shown us that we will one day arrive does not mean that God is ignoring us. It just means that what could have taken two years might take another 100 years, might take another 10 years. What we have to grow to as Christians is not to become impatient with what appears to be stagnation and understand that it's just God's will taking place according to God's purpose in our lives. Perhaps there's more lessons that we need to learn. Perhaps there's more lessons that our pressures need to learn. Perhaps God's timing is just beyond our understanding. And whatever the reason, we have to be faithful to understand that even though it may not come when we want him, he's an on-time God and he always shows up right on time. So it's easy to find the faith to pray to God but it becomes difficult to hold on to that faith and wait for God. And as Christians, we need to have the faith of waiting, the faith of patience. So the first part of our lesson is as we serve, God will bless. The second part of our lesson is God's promise prolonged but not precluded. Now we look at Luke chapter 1, 15 through 17, and we see God promises always have a purpose. So Luke 1, 15 through 17 reads, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So in this part of our lesson, Luke 1, 15 through 17, the angel of the Lord, Gabriel, informed, informed Zacharias that his promised son, John, will be great in the sight of the Lord. So Gabriel speaks to the righteousness and the character of uh, Zacharias' coming son, John. Now, the world determines greatness based on status, wealth, and what we accumulate. But God looks at our heart and how we treat others. And so John the Baptist will be great in the Lord, not because of the money that he has, not because his name will be in lights, not because he'll be the captain of the Jerusalem basketball team, but simply because he will do what God has called him to do and be faithful to that calling. Gabriel goes on to say he will not drink wine or strong drink. It shows that John will not dilute his mind with things that can change or alter his thinking or his living. Now, I mentioned earlier about being prepared and able and uh, available to be used by God, and I specifically mentioned uh, that we should not be hunted over 
And I understand that that phrase sometimes, especially in church, it just gives a negative connotation. And I'm not alluding to any alcohol problem that I have personally, but I'm just saying that in the culture in which we live in, social drinking has become so accepted that we often blur the line on what's too much and what's too far. Uh, through foreign mission work, I've learned specifically about alcohol consumption and that it can, tends to be more culturally dictated than biblically dictated. Uh, when I was in Vietnam, there was seldom times that we had meals without beer when we were in uh, kind of uh, fellowshipping with the locals and to turn down that beer was almost a sign of disrespect. Uh, when I got to Malawi at the Providence Industrial Mission, uh, drinking was 100% prohibited. And they even caught me up a few times when I was teaching at the seminary, asking me questions about how much should a preacher or how much was too much to drink. And I said well, that we should not be given to wine. And they kind of all looked crazy. I knew I kind of waded into the deep waters. It took me a challenging time to get back. Uh, but in America, it depends on who and where we are. I've been in churches where they preach and teach that we should not drink at all. I remember I was at a church in Mississippi that had communion. They had about 12 people in, three bottles of wine. After everyone took communion, they said the Bible says drink ye all of it. They finished all three bottles. And I, I was like, I don't think that's what I understood as communion. But we can't culturally dictate God's will in our lives. And so for the angel Gabriel to tell Zacharias that John will not be given to wine or strong drink, it alludes to the fact that those things can be deterrents in our worship and in our ministry. And I'm not here to dictate what you should or should not do. That's between you and God and how God reveals his will and his word in your life. But we must admit that the effects of alcohol cause us not to be ourselves. And so for John the Baptist to be ready and able to be used by God in the way that God needed him to be, the forerunner, the ambassador, the messenger for the Savior, the coming Savior, that John needs to be clear-headed. And many of us make excuses for the things that we do or the habits that we have but it's obvious, if we're honest with ourselves, that clear-headedness is necessary to be used by God. Uh, in the same manner, uh, police officers and doctors are often on call 24-7. Uh, even when they're not uh, in the office, so to speak, they're still expected to perform their responsibilities. However, the one exception I know about, at least with policing, is that the Chicago Police Department, if you've been drinking alcohol, your police powers uh, are not the same as if you're sober. And that's because they recognize if you've consumed alcohol, you're not in the right state to perform your responsibilities. And many of us as Christians, and our drug might not be alcohol. Our drug might be gluttony in food. Our drug might be specific drugs, recreational drugs, or even worse, abuse of, uh, of medicine. But it's important that we recognize the necessity to be clear-minded, to not be polluted uh, by, in this case, wine and strong drink, but whatever the world has to offer, to not pollute our minds and our bodies to the point that we become ineffective and unavailable to be used by God. Uh, Gabriel goes on to say that he'll have a special filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Old Testament, the filling of the Holy Spirit was based on obedience and necessity uh, of God. But as we begin to transition from the dispensation of the law into the dispensation of the church, uh, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God here is showing a shift in the way that the Holy Spirit is gifted to his children. And John appears to be one of the first people in the New Testament that's gifted or indwelled with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, for us as believers, the moment that we believe, God places his spirit inside of us. It's called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then John Calvin points out that here, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit is shown to be available to the youngest and the oldest alike. And he goes on to say that God ultimately decides the operation of the Holy Spirit in men. I believe specifically John Calvin says that the, the, the operation of the Holy Spirit is free in men, meaning that it's not restricted, it's directed by God. And Gabriel tells Zacharias that John will have a special gifting of this Holy Spirit. Then the angel specifically talks about the work that John will do. And if you look in the book of John, chapter 1, 6 through 9, you see a specific explanation of John's calling from God. It says that he was sent by God and that he will be a witness of God's light, which is God's love. And so this is the messenger of God being sent into the world to deliver the good news about Jesus Christ. Finally, Zacharias is told by Gabriel that John will go forward with the spirit and the power of Elijah. Now, Elijah considered one of the greatest prophets of all time. Uh, he was, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 
rain, he called down fire to rain from heaven. Uh, he raised fr people from the dead, and he was called up to heaven before he ever died. And so we know specifically about Elijah, but more specifically, Elijah was uh, the leader of the school of prophets, and he was known uh, for leading Israel into a life of righteousness, uh, no longer worshiping idol gods and idolatry, but living the life pleasing in the sight of God. And so Gabriel tells Zacharias, who's extremely familiar with Elijah, the words of Elijah, and the impact Elijah made on the children of Israel, that John the Baptist will have the same power that Elijah had. So we see as we serve God, God will bless. We see God's promise prolonged but not precluded. And we just cover God's promises always have a purpose. But we end this lesson that obstacles should never obstruct our faith. Luke chapter 1, verses 18 through 20 reads, And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which, we, which will be fulfilled in their own time. So after Gabriel gives Zacharias the good news, Zacharias responds with doubt, and questions. His age prevented him from having a child, and his wife Elizabeth was barren, and so he questioned how could this possibly happen. And then Gabriel reveals, I just love God. God told me to come down here and tell you this, seemingly to put an end to any doubt or questions that uh, Zach Zacharias might have about this prophecy. Uh, one thing that we must understand as Christians is that our worldly vision should never uh, pollute our faith or corrupt our faith. Zacharias looked at things quite logically. Scientifically, he was not of age to bear a child, and scientifically, his wife was unable to bear a child. And so he used the science of the world, he used his expertise, he used his wisdom, he used his experience to arrive at the conclusion that what God had sent word to him through his, prophet, through his angel Gabriel was impossible to happen. My brothers and sisters, nothing is impossible with God. And I remember the words of the Hebrew servants. I don't know if my God will, but I know that my God can. And I pray that that's the understanding that we have in each and every one of our faith. That regardless of what the doctor says, regardless of what the lawyer says, regardless of what uh, our loved ones and our close friends and associates might say, that God has the ultimate say on all things in our life. That I don't care if they said you'll never walk again. God can give strength to those bones. I don't say, I don't care if they say you'll never get out of that debt. God can restore what has been taken from us. God has the ability to supersede, to go beyond what we expect and what we ask. And so we must have the faith to say, regardless of what the world says is so or is not so, God has the ultimate final say in my life. And so uh, we see with our faith and not with our eyes. We don't use common sense or logic to dictate our lives. But we use our faith and our understanding of what God has for us is for us, and no one else can do anything about it. So Zacharias, because he doubted, because he questioned, he's punished for his doubt. Because he spoke when he should have listened, because he doubted what God had in store for him, Gabriel told him that he would not be able to speak until John was born. Now, we don't have the ability to change God's mind. We don't even have the ability to reject God's promise and, our bless and his blessings in our lives. But we do have the ability to block their effectiveness in our lives or our ability to operate within them. In what should have been a joyous and celebratory time in the life of Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, on what should have been the culmination of years of faithfulness and praying, of what should have been a celebratory time became a time of uncomfortability because of his doubt. Last point of this lesson. Many of us have in our past and many of us are right now. But moving forward, there is no need to miss out on the fullness of God's blessings or waste our time questioning or wondering what God is doing in our lives because God desires for us to receive the fullness of his love. Now, I don't know what that looks like in your life. I can tell you right now, for many of us, it may not be a million dollars. For many of us, it may not be that new car or that new home. But God does have blessings in store for each and every one of us. And if we get past complaining about what we don't have, and if we can move past questioning why God does what he does when he does it, we can stop complaining and stop worrying and start to just take a step back and realize that we are so blessed and more blessed than we deserve. I say it all the time. I may not have all that I want, but I surely have more than I need.
And it's just the evidence of God's blessing. Uh, I know that there are so many people in this nation, in this country, that are hungry, that are sick, that are going without. But I'm, I'm, I dare to say that if you're using some device to watch this virtual lesson right now, that if you really take a step back and just think about what God has done for you, in spite of our mistakes, in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of our failures, God continues to love us, he continues to bless us, and he truly has given us more than we need. So in this Christmas season, as we move closer and clo closer towards the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we enter the spirit of giving and the season of giving and being a blessing to others, let us just be mindful to not look at what we don't have, not focus on what we've missed out on, but to celebrate the blessings that we do have. God has given us so much, more than we could ask, more than we deserve. And Zacharias' evidence that God doesn't care about our timing, that God can bless when he's ready to bless us. It's our job to be faithful and available to be used by God. And in our service, in our faithfulness, we'll receive the blessings of God. What a wonderful lesson. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your presence. As always, we thank you for your prayers. If you have not subscribed to our channel or turned on notifications, please do so. You'll get all of our content, our Wednesday evening Bible classes taught by our pastor, Dr. Backus, and our Sunday morning worship services where you'll hear some of the best preaching this side of heaven. We do have other opportunities for you to worship with us. You can join us on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. where our laymen meet each uh, Tuesday led by our, our layman chairman, Deacon uh, De uh, Deacon Lucas, and then on Tuesday morning at 8 a.m., led by our senior associate, Reverend Aaron Davidson, we have a prayer call where we call out the name of each and every person on our sick and shut-in list that we ask for God's will to be done, not only within this church in our city, but throughout all of the creation. So the access code and the phone number is on your screen. And then we also encourage you to worship with us in your giving. We do have four ways for you to give here at Friendship Baptist Church. You can give through Cash App, dollar sign Friendship Chicago. You can give online, fbcchicago.org. You can text the word GIVE to 773-992-1462, or you can mail your check or money order to the church, Friendship Baptist Church, care of Dr. Reginald E. Backus, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. As always, we thank you uh, for supporting us during this time. We ask that you continue to let the love and the light of God shine in all that we do and all that we are, that we be equipped to face the challenges of tomorrow, and that we hold on to our faith, be ready to be used and available to be used by God at all times. We'll end with prayer, and then we'll, prayerfully we'll see you at our 11 a.m. service. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for a wonderful opportunity to worship your name in our study. Father, we thank you for your word that you made available to each and every one of us. Continue to grow us in your will, in your strength. Continue to help us to remain faithful. Uh, continue to uh, give us belief in the power of prayer, that you are a prayer answering God. I mean, it may not come when we want it to come, but it comes on time according to your purpose of our lives. We've entered this place to worship in our study, but we enter to worship in service to equip us with the tools necessary to face the challenges of life. And we'll be careful to give you the glory and praise in all that we say and all that we do. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. And a special, special happy birthday. Today is December 4th. Happy birthday to my wife, Christy. I pray that you have a wonderful, wonderful day and that God blesses you as he has already done so, that he continues to bless you with the riches and the desires of your heart. God bless and have a wonderful day.